The, ver- the verse that I want to turn your attention to this morning is the 11th verse of Psalm number 90. The first half of the verse indeed forms the text. A question which isn't answered in so many words, and yet the answer is palpably plain in the text, in the context, and throughout the Word of God. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Who knoweth the power of thine anger? The wrath of God is a very frequent theme in the pages of the inspired word. Not only so, but down through the years, thousands of sermons have been preached upon the subject. Sadly, I think many of them are sermons. I think it's sad that so many of us preachers can preach upon the wrath of God without any great searchings of heart, without any times of prayer where God melts our own souls before we preach. Sermons have been preached. And yet I fear that as far as many, many people are concerned, The case is something like this. They say, well, we have heard it all before. And they simply shrug off the whole subject and the entire theme of the wrath, the anger of a thrice holy God. Yet this morning, I feel that it is the will of God that we look at this text. And I'm asking you to think again. Whether you're saved or whether you're unsaved, I'm asking you to think again. Not merely to sit through a service and let the words pass over your head. For my friend, the day is certainly coming when both preacher and listener will give account to God for this day and give account to God for this message. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? I want you to consider the meaning of the words, the meaning of the anger of God. And let me state it absolutely clearly at the beginning, that when the Bible speaks of the wrath or anger or indignation of God, it is not speaking of a carnal passion. When man speak of their own anger, they are normally speaking of themselves getting into a situation where their passions run ahead of their thoughts and their reason, and they get out of control. This is no carnal passion, nor is it merely an impotent rage. When men voice their anger, It is usually the voice of impotence. It is usually the foamings of a person who can do nothing better. And their anger bespeaks their powerlessness in most cases. That is not the case with God. The anger of the Lord is not an impotent rage. It is not a vain and empty threatening. Rather, the anger and wrath of the Lord is the just expression of the holiness of God with regard to sin. When you think of it, God's anger is His attitude towards sin. And that brings into focus the divine attribute of holiness. We're living in a day when men have pulled down their standards. One glaring example is that uh, sociologists, that's a very nice big word for the greatest bunch of clowns that have uh, managed to besmirch and lead astray the whole of Western society. And if you're a sociologist, my apologies, not for my words, but for your folly in being one. Sociologists tell us that in Sweden there has been a drop 
in the crime rate, especially with regard to moral crimes. Wonderful. And of course, what they are trying to make us understand and what they're getting us to emulate in the rest of the Western world is the Swedish government's notions regarding moral legislation. If you loosen up, then the crime rate will go down. Sounds good. It's the greatest lie. Because why the crime rate has gone down is that men have gone through the moral legislation and they have said, that's not a crime anymore, that's not a crime anymore, that's not a crime anymore. And when you take all the crimes off the book, obviously nobody can be prosecuted for them. But the perpetration of the acts which once were crimes is growing at a tremendous rate. Men are dropping their standards. It used to be that certain things were not named even among the ungodly. And now they are named among the professing people of Jesus Christ. It used to be that it would take a very wicked man to go and watch a pornographic film in a public cinema. Now you have got so-called Christian families and they're sitting watching the same filth and the same drivel in their own homes. Men are changing their standards. I want to tell you that God's standards never change. And what was sin on the day when God revealed the commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai is sin today. Whoever likes it or whoever doesn't like it. God's holiness never changes. And because he is holy, the attitude of God to sin is an unchanging attitude. God never likes sin. That's the first thing. Secondly, God will never accept sin. Thirdly, God will never totally overlook sin. It may seem for a while that he does so. It is merely piling up wrath against the day of wrath. God never overlooks sin. That's his holiness. But God's holiness in its varied expressions is seen particularly in his justice. God is a just God. And being a just God He has wrath against sin. What is the anger of the Lord? The anger of the Lord is the expression of God's wrath against sin. That is the meaning of the term. Now let me move on quickly and think of the mystery of the power of God's anger. For the question is, Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Now, that's a great question. And it's a question which holds in it its own answer. Because obviously the answer is that no one on earth knows the power of God's wrath. That's the inference in the text. Now, I want you to get the significance of that. No one on earth, no one throughout the whole history of earth, among the sons of men, has ever known the power of the anger of God. Get the significance of it. Because, you see, there have been tremendous demonstrations of the anger of God throughout history. And yet the thought is that no demonstration of the wrath of God yet felt by man has demonstrated the full and awful power of the anger of God. When you turn back to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, you find that Adam is driven from the garden 
and the cherubim with the flaming sword turning in all directions is placed to bar his re-entrance. The wrath of God is seen. You turn over the pages of God's Word and you will find that the old world was destroyed in a flood that shook the world to its foundations and wiped out a numerous human population with the exception of one family circle and took with it the majority, the vast majority of all animal and plant life on the face of the planet. You turn over again and you find that at the Tower of Babel the wrath of God is revealed as God confuses and scatters the nations of men. Sodom and the cities of the plain were wiped off the face of the earth with fire and with brimstone from heaven and their monuments their salty monuments are still evident to this day when you visit the Dead Sea area of Israel. Right through the Word of God, you have these tremendous demonstrations of God's wrath. Where is the city of Nineveh today? Where is the city of Babylon today? That city whose walls were its boast that city whose defenses were impregnable, that city whose armies ruled the world, where is Babylon today? Where is Capernaum today? I have stood looking over the site of Capernaum, and all there is is rubble, and a few stones put together, and a few fragments of an ancient synagogue. I have looked over the site of Bethsaida and Chorazin. What is there? Grassland and rocks. They have been exalted to heaven. By the wrath of God they have been cast down to hell. Powerful expressions of God's wrath. Yet, my friend, I want you to think of this. When you see the flaming sword of the cherubim keeping Adam out of the garden, that is not the full demonstration of God's wrath. If you could imagine yourself to be in the old world in the days of Noah, with the great billows and waves dashing over you, with the rocks falling down upon you, with the world bursting apart in your presence. My friend, even that is not the full power of the wrath of God. Could you imagine yourself in Sodom and in Gomorrah, with the great hail from heaven falling, with the fire and the brimstone? My friend, remember, even that is not the fullness of the power of the wrath of God. Here then is a mystery. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? My friend, I wouldn't stand in a sinner's shoes. If Sodom and Gomorrah only felt a part of God's wrath, of that, if that picture is only a little demonstration, if it is but a vague hint of something greater to come, then not for all the money in the world, not for all the pleasures of sin, not for all the plaudits of an ungodly society, would I stand in the shoes of an unsaved man to face the fullness of the wrath of God. Can I speak finally on the manifestation of the power of God's anger? Who knoweth the power of thine anger? As I've shown you, God's anger has been manifested throughout history. In fact, when you turn to the first chapter of Romans, you will find some terrible words which describe the anger of God. Strange as it may seem, they are not the words that describe the flood. They are not the words that describe the fall of Sodom. They are not the words that describe the destruction of Tyre and Sidon. There are these words three times. In Romans 1, God gave them up. 
or God gave them over. Throughout the history of this world, there has been this demonstration of God's anger, where God turns away. I want you to listen. It happened to nations. It happened to individuals. And I want to tell you, my friend, it's happening today. It's happening today. I have often said to our folk back home in Northern Ireland that when our nation or if our nation, which God forbid, but if our nation refuses to repent, there will come a time when every free Presbyterian minister will be called to the ministry of a Jeremiah. I don't look forward to that day if it ever should come. It has often made me tremble. And I tell you the same thing in this country of yours, a country with a history of blessing. I tell you, unless there is a movement of the grace of God across this land of yours, there will come a day when no matter about all the pie-in-the-sky preachers and no matter about all the people who are so patriotic that they cannot see the sins of their nation, no matter how they preach, every faithful man of God is going to have to take a Jeremiah's ministry. Can you imagine what that's going to be? When a preacher's got to stand up and say, God has given this country up. He's done it before. Can you imagine what it will be when a man of God has got to say, the time when you can defend yourselves is gone. That's what Jeremiah had to preach to Israel. Lay down your arms. If you fight, you're fighting a losing cause, for God is against you. My friend, God has given nations up, and it ill behoves this country of yours, or my nation back across the ocean, to sit back at ease and sin. For I tell you, it's a dangerous place to sit. I want to be very, very clear with you. God has given families up. Some of you Christian parents would need to be very, very careful. The powerful laxity among so many of God's people nowadays. Powerful laxity. Not merely about rules and regulations which are only part of the story and far from the whole story, but there is a a, a terrible coldness of heart, a, an indifference to the things of God Uh, a mere religion that would put people off rather than a living love for Christ and a joyful experience of the Holy Ghost that would attract men and women to Christ. These are things that ought not to be among the people of God. Woe to the family when God will give them up. But I tell you, my friend, God gives up individuals. Uh, I thank God He has been slow to do it. But he's done it. (laughs) If you're in this meeting this morning and you have a history of gospel preaching behind you and you have a heritage of gospel invitation after gospel invitation and yet you're throwing it all away for the husks of sin. And I want to tell you, my friend, Yours is a dangerous position. Woe to the man when God the Holy Ghost stops speaking. Woe to a woman or a young person whom God will give up. For I tell you, when God stops speaking, that is always, always a demonstration of God's anger. It is in love that the Lord lays on the rod of his word. It is in love that God convicts the conscience and the heart. It is in love that God would make it hard for you to kick against the pricks. It is in love that he would make it difficult for men and women and young people to kick over the traces and go down to hell. When he withdraws that speaking voice of the Spirit of God, That is a mark of judgment. 
yet that is not the final manifestation. Because that full manifestation of God's anger awaits the time when first the Lord will come. We were singing of that day in one of the hymns, the crowning day, the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will come in power and in glory. My friend, not only is it the crowning day for the people of God, I want you to notice it's the day of condemnation for those who have rejected Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I want you to think of the words and in God's name let them sink in to your heart. Or as the Lord Jesus said when he was giving the parable of the sower and the four kinds of seed. Let these words sink down into your ears. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7 To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. Wonder does that include you? Wonder are you here this morning and you don't know the Lord? And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's the power of God's anger. As it's put for us, In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 23, in similar words in chapter 25 and verse 41, depart from me. That's the power of God's anger. Into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. As the book of the Revelation puts it in chapter 20 and the 15th verse, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is the power of God's anger. My friend, if you want to get a picture of that power demonstrated, there's one place in the history of the world to which you can go. In one place only. It's the place called Calvary. There God gave to the world a demonstration of the fullness of his wrath. A demonstration and yet something that they themselves could not feel. Such is the mercy of God. When God gives to the world a preview of the wrath of God and the judgment of God, he visits that wrath and judgment upon the head of his own dear son. That's why we sang that hymn this morning, O Christ, what burden thou thy head. Some tremendous words in it. And yet the best verse of the hymn is omitted for some reason or other. You've heard me quote it before. Jehovah Bad his sword awake. O Christ, it woke against thee. Thy blood the flaming blade must slake. Thy heart its sheath must be. All for my sake, my peace to make. Now sleeps that sword for me. My friend, if you want to see the sword of divine justice and vengeance, go to Calvary. Because in Romans 8.32 I read that God spared not His own Son. When the Lord Jesus hung upon the cross, He was the sinless, pure and spotless Lamb of God. But in a legal and judicial capacity, he 
took upon him all the guilt of all the sins of all his people. And as he there was invested with the guilt of my sin, Jehovah smote his son. We read that there was darkness. A darkness that the world has never known the like of in all its history. And in that darkness when men had done their worst to the body of the Son of God. And when demons had vented their fury in the frame of God's Lamb. In that darkness God the Father visited the judgment and the punishment of the sins of God's people in the person of God's own Son. Tell me, if God spared not His own sinless Son when He took the guilt of our sins upon Him, what must be the end of a guilty rebellious, thoughtless, carnal, evil, living sinner who will go out to meet God without the covering of the Redeemer's blood. When you get to the cross, you'll see the power of God's anger. It's shown in punishment and it's shown in banishment. The twin prongs of the wrath of God. Punishment. And banishment. For all eternity. Men and women. Let me tell you. That the wrath of God must be revealed. And must be visited on every sin that has ever been committed. If there is one sin that God never judges, in that moment he will cease to be God. And that's an impossibility. Not one sin will ever go unpunished. And I tell you this morning, either your sin is punished in Christ, either your sin is put under the blood and you are hiding in Christ, or else your sin must be punished in you. It's one or the other. And if there is one sin, of course this is but a, a hypothetical case because it's an impossibility, but to heighten the, the argument, if there were just one sin of yours that was not under the blood of God's Lamb, that sin would damn your soul under the power of God's wrath for all eternity. Why you need to get to the cross. It's why you need to get to the blood. It's why you need to get to the place where God's wrath has already been visited. There's a fellow down there who could preach the rest of this sermon better than me. The brother Jonathan comes from Australia. I have never been there, but I have been told, and I'm sure you have, that when a great bush fire will rage, despite all the modern appliances that can be brought to bear, as it eats up everything, man and beast and foliage within its path, there is one sure way of escape, if there's time. Many years ago, there was a homesteader who knew that the winds were carrying that all-engulfing flame in his direction. And so, like a madman, he set to work. 
And his wife thought he had gone crazy, for she herself had forgotten what ought to be done. And they started in a huge circle right around the home. And they burned everything in sight. So that there wasn't a twig that wasn't reduced to ashes. Then they stood in the middle. And as the flame came, it came right up to where the foliage was and the undergrowth was and it skirted right around where they were standing. They had learned the lesson. If you would be safe, you must stand where the fire has already burned. My friend, there is one place where the fire is burned. And that place is Calvary. That place is the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And oh, if you would be free and safe and secure from the burning power of God's anger. Let me tell you, man or woman or young person, stand where the fire has burned. May you get to the cross today. May you get to the blood today. May you receive Christ today. May that be the only way you'll ever know the power of the anger of God.